called them to believe the Lord because of the provision he was going to make for them. Chapter 16, reading from verse 15. Chapter 16, verse 15, And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna. Actually, that's what manna means. What is this? What is this in their language? And when they said manna, it's like, what is this? And that's what we know as manna today. For they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord giveth you to eat. He gave them bread to eat, gave them quails to eat, and gave them water out of the rock. Chapter 17, verse 4. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do? Unto this people, they be almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, and take with thee of the elders of Israel, and thy rod, therewith thou which for which thou smotest the river, and take in thine hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rod in hurry, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He provided for them. He fought their battles for them. And now he brought them to a covenant. And the covenant he brought them to was to show them how they were now to live. He gave them the law that will guide them. The law that will show them how they will live. As you come to these following chapters, you'll find the law. But three perspectives of the law. Three divisions of the law. And you're asking which one applies to the church today. Look at the three. Number one, the moral law. That's what you'll find in Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 to 17. Number two, the civil law. The civil law was given to them so that they'll be observed by Israel under a theocratic government. Believers are now not under those civil laws of Israel, but under the civil government, civil authority in every nation. Our nations have laws concerning how you build, concerning the right of road when you are driving, concerning relationship one to the other. And they have the law enforcement agents to look into those civil laws. We're not under the civil laws of Israel. You're not the civil law of your country. And then there's a the ceremonial law. Number one, the moral law. Number two, the civil law. Number three, the ceremonial law. The ceremonial law has been totally fulfilled by Christ. So we don't uh, go through the ceremonial laws anymore. Those are the offerings and the sacrifices and the, and the ordinances. All animal sacrifices have been fulfilled in Christ. He is a final sacrifice. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 7. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that she may be a new lamb, as ye are unleavened. Listen to this. For Christ... Even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. That's why we don't observe the ceremonial laws of Israel. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. We're looking at Romans chapter 13. In Romans chapter 13, verse 1, 
Here is for the New Testament believers now, our civil law, not the civil laws of Israel. This ours. Let every man be subject unto higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Sucking of the government in every nation, whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For the rulers, governors, presidents, law enforcement agents, for the rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. That is, if you break the laws of the nation where you live, be afraid, for he bears not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because for this cause pay ye tribute also. For they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very scene. Render therefore to all their dues tribute to whom tribute is due. Custom to whom custom fear to whom fear honor to whom honor. But now, concerning the moral law, the Lord has that law in two parts. Commandments 1 to 4, summarizing their love to God. Commandments 5 to 10, their love to their neighbors. And what do we learn today about the moral law? Verse 10. Romans chapter 13, verse 10. Love walketh no ill to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the moral law. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation, final salvation. Final redemption nearer than when we believed. The night is fast spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chimpering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Love to God, love to our fellow man is the fulfillment of those Ten Commandments which make up the moral law. Matthew chapter 22, reading from verse 37. Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. Jesus says unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second, the second part of the law. The second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two, the first part, the second part. On these two commandments hang 
all the law and the prophets. That tells us then what our responsibilities are today. We come to the final section of the book of Exodus. Exodus, reading from chapter 25 all through to chapter 40, takes up the tabernacle. And it is the representation and the picture of the Redeemer. As you look at those chapters, you'll see, number one, the earthly sanctuary. Number two, you'll see the holiest of all, the holy of holies. Number three, you'll see the veil that divides the holy place from the holy of holies. Number four, you'll see the altar where the blood animals, the blood of animals was split, shed for the redemption, forgiveness, the covering of the iniquities. You'll see the place of the high priest. You'll see those sacrifices and you'll find the ark, the ark of the covenant, then the altar of incense. As you read all those uh, chapters talking about the tabernacle, we're told in the New Testament the significance of them all. Exodus chapter 25, verses 1 and 2. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart. Shall he take, shall ye take my offering? What were they to do? Verse 9, According to all that I show thee after the pattern, of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments that's what I've been talking about all the instruments thereof even so shall ye make it verse 40 of that verse chapter 25 and look that thou make them after the pattern which was showed thee in the mount, the building of the tabernacle, to take after the pattern which shall be shown to him on the mount. In Hebrews chapter 8, Hebrews chapter 8, referring to that which the Lord had told Moses. Here is the application for us New Testament believers. It's so fulfilled in Christ. Chapter 8 of Hebrews verse 5 who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. All those things were shadows pointing to the reality that you find in Christ. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, says he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Application, verse 6. But now, he has obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. As you look at the details of the tabernacle, it shows the presentation and the picture of Christ, the Redeemer. There's the heavenly sanctuary now. Chapter 8 of Hebrews verse 2. A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. The true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. We we'll talk of the holiest of all, the holy of holies. Chapter 10, verse 19, Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10, 
reading from verse 19. Here it says, Have been therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. All that tabernacle revelation built it this way, according to this pattern, is ultimately pointing to Christ. And now we can enter into the very presence of God, into the holiest of all, by the blood of Jesus, the veil that divides, that divided the holy place from the holy of holies, talking about the flesh of Jesus that was broken for you and for me, chapter 10, verse 20, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, which veil, that is to say, his flesh. I will talk about the place and the position and the ministry of the high priest, verse 21, having an high priest over the house of God. Hebrews chapter 7, reading from verse 25, and verse 26, chapter 7, verse 25, Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. That's what the high priest of the Old Testament did for them sacrificing for them, praying for them, representing them before the altar. Christ does that for us now, for such and high priest, verse 26, became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. He is now our great high priest, Hebrews chapter 4. Reading from verse 14. See there. That we have a great high priest. That is passed into the heavens. Jesus the son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest. Which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. But... He was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. That's contrasting Christ, our high priest, with Aaron, the high priest of Israel. He had sin. He had failure. He had his fault. He faltered. But in our own case, our high priest in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. Was the conclusion of that as they came to the altar? We can now come before the Lord because it says, Let us therefore, let us therefore, as you think about all that is revealed of the exodus, the exit, the departure, the rescue, the deliverance of the children of Israel out of bondage. And God said over and over and over, I will. And he did it. If God has also planned a redemption, let us therefore come boldly. By the blood of the Lamb, the sins were forgiven. The slavery was cancelled. They were totally delivered. If that is so, and he has done the same thing for us. Because he died for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. Was the conclusion? Let us therefore come boldly. They had an altar, and they had to sacrifice perpetually, annually. The year of atonement was there for them. In our own case, Christ, the Lamb of God, has died once and for all. It's not something he has to be repeating every time. It's not gone into heaven. And he's standing there for you, for me, for the redeemed. What's the conclusion? Let us therefore come boldly. He provided for them in the wilderness. After paying the price of redemption. 
after preparing them for redemption. They came out of captivity. And he provided the water, provided the manna, provided the shade, the protection, the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. And he said, I will be an enemy, an adversary to your adversaries. What's the conclusion? He'll do the same thing for us. Let us therefore come boldly. And now the tabernacle has been raised so that all the needs, spiritual needs, mental needs, emotional needs, and physical needs, every need will be supplied as the high priest will represent them before the almighty God. And we have a greater high priest, a sinless high priest, a spotless high priest, a compassionate high priest, a more loving high priest. What's the conclusion? Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Exodus speaks about redemption. Your redemption, my redemption, our redemption. It's all accomplished. It is finished. All needs are now provided for, for the redeemed. We can come to the Lord and find mercy, find grace. This time at the time of need. Praise the Redeemer. Thank Him for your redemption. Appropriate all, re all that redemption means to you. You can come boldly. It will not fail you. It will not disappoint you. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. You come confidently. You come boldly. Believing all the provision he has made for the redeemed of the Lord. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace. He redeems from sin. He redeems from slavery. He redeems from captivity. And as you come to him, holding to that redemption, provision of redemption, mercy, grace, provision, are all made available. He is our Redeemer. He is our High Priest too. We have an altar which the old covenant people did not have. Appropriate all the provisions of your redemption. Let's continue to talk to the Lord. Consider the price, the process of redemption. Bring this back home and see what the Lord has done in your own life. Appreciate that. Thank God for your own redemption. 
bringing you out of sin and into his marvelous light. See that movement out of the world, out of evil, out of sin. And now you are in the kingdom of God. Why don't you appreciate God for this? Praise his name.